A professional counselor in the Dallas area is growing in popularity for his treatment methods. How do you talk to kids about terror? And with social media and television, it's everywhere and it's unavoidable for kids. Rusty Lozano is the founder of the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. He's also been nationally recognized for his work with brain mapping. He's created a gym to work out the mind. His office features an obstacle course. Here's where Lozano comes in. He teaches kids how to think their pain away with something called biofeedback. Rusty Lozano, a leading uh, therapist and uh, pediatric biofeedback therapist based in Texas at the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy. And uh, Rusty, thanks for being with us tonight. Rusty Lozano, a father of four and also a professional counselor in Texas, says it's all about being a credible resource to your children. The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Your dedicated resource for mental health news, views, and tips you can use. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. And now, here's Rusty. And good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rusty Lozano. And you're listening to the Therapy Hour. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. On KFXR, Talk Radio 1190, iHeartMedia. So, I have a really cool show today and a very, very cool guest. Uh, a while back, a few, probably a few years ago, I was flipping through the stations like on television late night and looking for something to watch. And I come across this show uh, where they had contestants that were completely naked and and could choose. And, and here's the gist of it. They can choose a weapon or choose a tool of some sort. It could be a weapon, it could be a pot, it could be something that they uh, actually used as, you know, to help them be able to to uh, survive. Because the, the whole gist of the uh, the whole gist of the show is survival, but without clothes on. And so they put these contestants, one male, one female, they put them in really awkward situations and uh, see how well they can actually perform uh, and survive through the elements. So they have to build their own shelter. Have to find their own water, gather their own food, and see how well they can actually, you know, thrive in a situation like that. Well, it's taxing, you know, because uh, sometimes they end up in in wet areas or in uninhabitable, uh, very uncomfortable places. Uh, sometimes they're, they're they, you know they can find a pretty decent place, but they they make what they can out of it, and uh, and I, I think it's a really fascinating show. I've had a few of these guys actually on in the past and uh, and you know listening to their story and like you know what kind of person does something like this uh, really interesting stuff so my guest today who joins us is uh tawny lynn she was on um uh, she was on naked and afraid two times uh once in africa once in florida and uh anyways a little bit about her she recently filmed a music video with country artist ryan weaver and uh, two of the survivors from the terrorist attack in Benghazi. The movie 13 Hours is based on the the, the situation that happened in Benghazi. Huge controversy. Um, and she's also a gun model and a gun enthusiast, enthusiast. And I've seen some videos of her on YouTube where she's, you know, shooting some automatic r- rifles and uh, in, in distance shooting. It's really amazing. So my guest, Tony Len, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be a part of this. Yeah. Hey, you know, when I learned about like the show and, and I learned about yours in particular, I was really, I was really intrigued because, um, you know, people, it's hard to tell how people are going to actually, they're going to have an effect or, uh, you know, how they're going to perform in situations like this. Um, and so when you watch the show, you never know what you're going to end up with. Some people quit. Some people have to quit. And uh, some people kind of mosey on through, but then like what ends up happening is it kind of dredges up things from their past. And not only are they there, they're contesting against the elements, but then whatever they bring with them. So whatever circumstances they've lived through. And, uh, and you know, that's something I think is, is really fascinating about the show, how people go and, and try to overcome and challenge themselves on, on, on things that they've dealt with in the past is, would you agree? Was that something that you've you've actually experienced? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the emotional state that that your body is in um, 
in reaction to the malnutrition and, you know, the, the taxing on your body and, and your mind, um, it, it will bring out the worst in you. Um, it, it puts you in a really vulnerable state and, um, you know, it, it just, you have no choice but to kind of face um, your baggage and, and stuff that you've kind of kept bottled up maybe your whole life or, or you know, however long. But um, the effect that it has on your mind and your emotions being out there um, without your everyday luxuries is just, it's incredible. So you were on the show Naked and Afraid in Florida, and, uh, and was this in the Everglades? You know, it wasn't the Everglades specifically, but the terrain, um, basically identical. I mean, you're in that swampy, um, jungly, very humid environment. Um, so I, I pretty much describe it as the Everglades. It mm-hmm. creates a good picture for, for everyone. Man, you know what I think about? I think about mosquitoes and like bugs and you know uh, things that can sting you. <laughs> Being in right. a situation like that, <laughs> you know, I think that that's uh, that would be one of those like lots of critters running around. Uh, oh, you know what absolutely. I want to do? Uh, I'm going to play a little excerpt of your show, and there's something interesting I want to talk to you about. I'm going to let let the little segment speak for itself, and then I want you to kind of explain something to me. So uh, okay. this is from a a clip from the Naked Confessions uh, of the Florida Naked and Afraid series with Tawny. Here we go. Yeah, that was a, that was a shock. I remember this one time when um, when we saw this big alligator, probably, I don't know, the seven, eight-foot alligator, um, just uh, chilling in that little creek where we used to, to fish and, and relax. So that was pretty, um, pretty intense because he was probably less than five yards away from where we used to to take our little baths and uh, and just uh, lay down during the day. I started hearing voices of people that were not there and seeing things that were not necessarily there. Um, and uh, it felt pretty disturbing because I've never f- seen or experienced anything like that before. So I chalk it up to, you know, the lack of sleep and the lack of proper n- nutrition. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you, at least in my case, you don't know that you're going to experience that until you're in that situation. When I realized Julio was leaving, it really didn't come as a surprise to me. Um, I went into this challenge being prepared to do it alone and had a feeling I would be doing it alone anyways, so it kind of didn't surprise me at all. And I hyperventilated a little bit at first, and then I was just like, whatever, let's do this. So, okay, this is one of the things that kind of drew me to to you and, and listening to to how this all went down. So your partner had a mental breakdown. And uh, and so here you guys, you're both going through a really distressful situation. Um, and, you know, that's life, right? I mean, it's kids experience this kind of thing in schools. Uh, but you're both going through this, and all of a sudden, like, you know, he makes an outcry. What is this? What are you thinking at this point when you when you start to see Julio decompensate? You know, you could really see him kind of start slipping. Um, even days before he had that, like, verbal breakdown. And my immediate thought is, I'm about to do this alone, you know? Mm. And um, So did it scare you? Did, you? did you know that you were about to, I mean, did you know that was coming? Or was it a complete surprise to you? You know, I had a feeling going into this challenge just because... Like you kind of sized them up. I'm sorry? Like you kind of sized them up, you think? Not even that, but going into this challenge before I met my partner, I I just had this thought and this instinct that there's a possibility I could be doing this alone. And so I, I really tried to center my training around, you know, that concept of not having a partner you know, I wanted to learn how to do everything um, in the event that I would be doing this alone. And so 
when he started to vocalize these things, that was what my mind ran to. You know, I kind of dodged what was going on with him and immediately went into survival mode, you know, like, okay, gear up, you're about to be solo, you mm-hmm. know? And so, um, you know, I, my, my concern was, you know, protect yourself mm-hmm. <laughs> and start, start, you know, getting your mindset to you're alone because I just, I knew it was coming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you see it coming, you, you start planning for the worst. And and right. you know what I want to get into? Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break here in a little bit. But what I want to get into, uh, I have another clip where you start to describe, you know, how this becomes a very personal thing to you because you personally have experienced uh, situations where people have kind of left you. And now this is bringing up, not only are you dealing with the elements, but now it's bringing up something completely personal and emotional. And, uh, and now you're going to have to deal with two things. Uh, now it's it's ripped open a scab in a wound, and you're compromised and you're alone, and so there, you have nobody to talk to. So how on earth can can you process something like this? And this is the exact reason I wanted to actually do a show like this because uh, your answer is going to affect maybe the way that somebody who's out there, you know, a teenager, a pre adolescent, a little girl, um, or a little boy for that matter. Uh, is going to then look at their own life and try to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back after these messages, guys. Hang tight, and we'll be uh, visiting with Tawny Lynn. My dad totally can't. Hi, Coach Gary, inviting you to listen to Sports Talk Sunday nights from 6 to 7 p.m. on 1190. Now, you can hear us clearly on the iHeart app and click on 1190 Dallas-Fort Worth Talk Radio. I'm joined by Warren Shore. He's also known as the Wiz Kid. You know, it's fun to get his opinion because he is a millennium. We also got Ben Martin. He's the glue to the show. He answers your phone calls at 214 or 817 1190 Make sure to join us every Sunday night, 6 to 7 on 1190, the station that knows talk. The huge credit bureau breach may have dropped off your news feed, but your information may not have dropped off the dark web. Once your personal information is out there, thieves can use it to steal your identity for months, even years after a breach. Fortunately, it's not too late to get protection with LifeLock. Sign up today and we'll begin using proprietary technology to monitor your personal information for threats, including new accounts in your name, money being stolen from your 401k, or your information being sold on the dark web. And if there's a problem, one of our U.S.-based identity restoration agents will work to fix it. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but with LifeLock, you'll know your identity is on our radar, even if the last breach is long forgotten. Go to LifeLock.com or call 1-800-LIFELOCK today to get 10% off when you use promo code NEWS. That's promo code NEWS. LifeLock. More detection, more protection. Do you have a DWI on your record? Does it haunt you every time you apply for a job? You may be able to seal that DWI conviction. Receive an auto-dialed text message from the law offices of Greg Ray by dialing pound 250, keyword DWI, or go to DWISealed.com, Principal Office, Rockwall, Texas. Do you have a DWI? Does it continue to punish you even though you paid the price years ago? You may be able to seal that DWI conviction. Receive an auto-dialed text message from the law offices of Greg Ray by dialing pound 250. 50, keyword DWI, or go to DWISealed.com, Principal Office, Rockwall, Texas. You're listening to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano, brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hello, we're back. And if you're just joining us, we have Tawny Lynn, contestant from Naked and Afraid. She's been on twice. And she is a toughie. Uh, she has, you can read her bio in Discovery Channel and uh, look at what she has actually been through. And, and we're going to get into, you know, some of the things that that she's like uh, experienced and, and had difficulty with um, throughout her entire life and what she what she's actually processing and, and how she's been doing with it. I'm going to play you another segment from the show just so that you can kind of hear, get an idea of, of who this particular contestant is. This is from uh, Naked and Afraid, Florida. Having succumbed to the extreme stress of the challenge, Julio reached his breaking point. 
on day five for his safety and for Tony's. The producers decided to take him out. I feel really guilty that I left uh, Tony down. And, you know, she was really polite about it, but I could tell in her eyes the disappointment and even okay. anger, and I don't blame her. If she truly knew what was going on in my head, she would be like, yes, you need to leave. This would be probably, I don't know, the seventh or eighth time someone's abandoned me. I mean, it's, it's a normal gesture in my life, so as far as being here, I mean, I, I grew up on my own, so I can be here on my own. I'm just pissed at him. Tell us a little bit about that, Tawny. So You know what, Rusty? I actually did not hear anything. <laughs> oh, you didn't hear that? No. Oh, no. Well, okay, so what happened is um, is he was leaving, and and he was upset, and he said, well, if she only knew what I was really thinking, um, and he walked off, and then you had made this the statement that, well, you you've already been abandoned seven, eight times. So this is kind of a normal thing in your life. Uh, you know, you basically raised yourself. So that's a pretty hard blow. Uh, this is, dr- this is bringing stuff up from the past that you've, you've encountered and you've, you've been working on and, and have overcome. And, and I don't know to what degree you've overcome. Cause, um, I mean, who's to say what, you know, what, what's considered a, a normal function and not normal function, but it's an experience that you had, and it definitely had an impact on the quality of your life. Uh, tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your past? Or what, what are you talking about when you said you've basically had to raise yourself? Well, I grew up with quite a bit of struggles, starting at a really young age. Um, you know, there was there was quite a bit of abuse that I experienced, um, and you know, I don't want to speak illy of my parents. Um, we are on good terms now. I will clarify that. Um, I am a big person on forgiveness and moving on and letting go. And, um, but anyways, you know, it started at a very young age and I was definitely the second choice as far as, um, you know, who came first versus me or, or a man in my mom's life. And the emotional impact that has on a child can't even be put into words. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of shipped back and forth between my mom and dad and, you know, again, the second choice in in his marriage. Were you, were your parents divorcing? Well, they divorced at a, um, when I was around like eight years old, seven or eight years old. And even that, you know, was such a messed up situation. My mom just kind of took off with someone and, Mm. and left my brother and I, and so, and then your yeah. dad, and then so you guys had to move with your dad. Yeah, yeah. Well, I ended up leaving and, and going and being with my mother, and, you know, that's when the the abuse started. And, and I was a second choice, and I was in um, a toxic situation, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the one that she decided to be with. And so, you know, that's that's something I struggle with every day, and I will probably always struggle with that. Um, so that calls in the question, like your whole feeling of acceptance, am I acceptable and am I lovable? And absolutely. And so at a young age, you, you know, the, the mind is a very powerful thing and especially a young mind, young imagination. So filling in the gaps as to like, why I know, uh, in, in a lot of circumstances, kids can be pretty egocentric and, and blame themselves somehow. Uh, did you find yourself doing things like that? Absolutely, you know, and it was explained to me that it was my fault, and it took me a really long time to accept the fact that it wasn't, and it was circumstances beyond my control, Mm -hmm. Um, and the fault didn't lie with me, and that wasn't even until, you know, recent years that I accepted that what happened to me was not my fault, Yeah. Um, and it doesn't define me. And that you were a victim, right? Absolutely. Right. So let me let me ask you something. Something like this will actually start. I can imagine having an effect on trust issues and and trust in, in relationships moving forward. Did you experience things like that in your lifetime with uh, with relationships that like as you got older? Oh my gosh, Rusty, I struggle with that to this day. 
you know, my, my trust issues um, are so far beyond anything that I feel like I can ever recover. You know, when you have both parents that at the end of the day didn't want you, um, that's really something that's tough to overcome. You know, how do you accept that? How do you, how do you live with that and, and not let it affect your relationships? It's affected every single one of my relationships, you know, to the point that my relationships became toxic because, you know, I try to push people away before they push me away. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, um, leave before you are left. It's, it's kind of been my, my life motto, you know, and, um, so you, I am you married kind now of, and go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're married now. I am married now and we've had so many challenges with me, you know, trying to push him away. And he's, he's been the only man that has stuck with me through, through these challenges, you know, and has taken the time and effort to convince me otherwise, you know, I don't know. I don't know how he does it. I don't know why he does it. But I'm I'm very grateful that I, f- I found someone that's willing to stick with me through these challenges in my life. Yeah, you know, in the counseling field, uh, we call that unfinished business, and that's a it's a phrase that's typically used to describe emotions and memories, like surrounding a past experience that a person has avoided or kind of repressed and kept inside, and the feelings around the event are not really fully processed at that particular time. So often really what happens is, uh, well, because it was, it was too much an overwhelming traumatic, traumatic situation. They replay these, these scenarios over and over and over again to try to learn from them. This is a subconscious process. And, uh, and this is uh, part of what's a a therapy, therapeutic approach called gestalt therapy. And there are different approaches to counseling. You know, when you go in and speak to somebody that have different, uh, training and different backgrounds and qualifications, but uh, but on gestalt therapy, uh, this is one of those concepts called unfinished business. So it's so subconscious that you know there's a practicality part of trying to understand it, like a rational explanation, like you know in your mind, like everything that you just got through saying that it, you know it wasn't your fault, and and you can rationalize through that, and and you can tell your story, but then on an emotional level. Uh, when you see and recognize and you play out those situations there in front of you, like the mind automatically goes into this rebuttal where um, a person will will either preemptively judge or preemptively judge jump to conclusions and uh, and maybe ac- be accusatory or uh, or sense that something's about to happen and then they'll go ahead and and react as if it did, you know, sabotaging a situation. And they do this unknowingly. Does that any of that sound familiar? It sounds so familiar. I mean, you just described me to a T. Um, mm. It's. I mean, you couldn't be any more like on point with with what goes on in my head. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and, and the interesting thing about it is like this. It's it's a it's a subconscious journey that that we all everybody has some encounter with their parents. I mean. Like I said earlier, you, you show me a definition of normal, and I will learn something new. Because everybody has something different. It doesn't matter how how kent and well put together they seem on the outside. There's always something underneath the surface, and it's a person's experience that actually makes them. And so when I I guess what drew me to this show is and I even have my own dirt on myself. Um, but I see these people and and they how they how the personalities kind of work together, and how people kind of they either clash with the environment or they clash within themselves. Now, this was a perfect opportunity for you uh, because you were um, you were on your own, and and then you brought up this abandonment element, and then and then the voice that came out was that well, I raised myself anyways, and I I already suspected that I was going to do this on my own, and so you went into this full on survival mode, and and you did it. You finished that challenge, which I think is just tremendous, and it shows uh, a. a tremendous amount of valiant strength and emotional and psychological determination that, uh, that you know, that, that's, that's, that's example worthy, you know, because it's not about your past. It's not about the relationships. And I know there's more, and I'd like to, to, to talk about it with you because it seems like there's been a, a, an entire trait of these experiences that have, have entered your life and, and that you have uh, encountered even as you were 
um, like trying out for the show, something pretty substantial would happen. But I'll leave that up to you if you want to bring it up because I, I know your bio, but it's out there. But obviously, you know that you've written about it, and so you know it's there. But, you know, one thing I just kind of want to point out to you, and I know I'm, I'm kind of self-dialoguing because I'm really intrigued by this, um, but I think that when I, when I see somebody like you go out and like you are in the elements, you're, you're um, physically compromised, you're tired, you're emotionally drained, uh, and then somebody, somebody pills open one of these um, personal circumstances uh, there's you have a lot of pieces to put together, right? And so, how do you do that? How does somebody who's been through an experience like that? How can you piece it all together? Like, what what is your process? I couldn't even tell you what that process is. I mean, when you're in that situation and you're alone with your thoughts, and you're you're away from the the social media the the television you know the being able to jump in your car and go for a drive um your thoughts are racing and i was able to just kind of dissect my life so to speak you know i just mm-hmm. went over and over and over and over all these things that had happened to me in my life and and just kind of analyze it you know and i've never in my life been able to do that i've never been able to really kind of go into depth in my you. own head yeah and just take a really long look you know in the mirror without having a mirror okay, and hold, hold that thought a really long look in the mirror without having a mirror we're going to take a quick commercial break we'll be right back Hi, it's Fisher, the Radio Root Sleuth, host of Extreme Genes Family History Radio. Every week right here, we bring you the latest on how to dig up your dead, plus amazing stories of discovery and expert guests. Maybe we can help you find who you're looking for. Tune in to the Extreme Genes Radio Show, hosted by Scott Fisher, Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. on Talk Radio 1190. If you're interested in finding out where you came from, listen to Extreme Genes Radio. The largest custom window covering company in North America, with over 25 years in business, has teamed up with the most established name in smart home technology. Together, we're introducing Smart Shades by Budget Blinds and Lutron. Now, opening and closing your shades with a touch of a button is easier than ever. Program them to open and close for safety, energy savings, and peace of mind. They work with so many smart home devices. You can control them from anywhere in the world with your smartphone. And since they're cordless, they're a great choice for kids and pets. Smart Shades are so easy to use and easy to afford. Get style and service for every budget. Get Smart Shades from Budget Blinds and Lutron. Call 855-BUDGET-BLINDS now for your free smart home consultation. 855-BUDGET-BLINDS or go online to budgetblinds.com at participating independently owned and operated franchises only. Ask for details. On a normal day, the seats at Camping World Stadium in Orlando are filled with thousands of screaming fans. But on December 16th at the 2017 AutoNation Cure Bowl, those same seats can do a whole lot more. Join us at the 2017 AutoNation Cure Bowl to help fund breast cancer research. Can't make the game? Make a donation to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation at any AutoNation store and get an AutoNation pink plate for your car. Get your tickets at CureBowl.com. Texting while driving can be as dangerous as drinking and driving. Put your phone away. A message from the Texas Department of Transportation. Talk, text, crash. You're listening to The Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hello. Welcome back to the show. If you are just joining us, we have uh, Tani Lynn. I keep wanting to say Tani Katane, but she was like this model on uh, the White Snake <laughs> video. Because, you know, I haven't said the word Tani. I, I've known very little Tani's in my life. But Tani Lynn... And she's been on the show Naked and Afraid two times. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we just now started to get into what she went through an experience where she, her parents got a divorce. Or, you know, she went through some turbulence at, at a very young age. And uh, 
and what is her process? So she started talking about like, well, you started looking at yourself from a distance. What are some of those steps that you that you take, Tani? Like, what is your process to kind of un unmend yourself when you get really upset or something triggers those personal emotions in you? Well, first and foremost, I never would have been able to analyze my life and and the trauma that I've been through had I not done the show because it gave me that ability to isolate myself from from your everyday life luxuries. Um, you know, we're creatures of habit and and that that works against us in so many ways. And being alone like that in that isolated state it gave me that ability to to go over all of these things in my life. And I was really able to to look at myself and look at my life and ask myself what makes me unhappy, what I don't like about my life, and what do I want to change and how do I want to change it? Mm-hmm. You know, so you have to you have to know what you value and what you want your life to be and what you're unhappy with and how are you gonna change that. Mm-hmm. And I've never been able to do that before. Yeah, and- because, you know, here's the thing. I mean, and, and I want to talk a little bit more about, like, your bio and, and what it what it actually discussed. Did you write that bio, by the way? I did write that bio. Okay, so, so you know, and that's that's healthy because I think that when a person can actually speak openly about their ex- their negative experiences, that's a sign of, that's a sign of recovery. That's a sign of, of healing. That's a, that's a healthy sign. But let me just kind of give a rundown to the audience. And, you know, what I read on the bio, uh, so you had the abandonment issues uh, at, with your parents at a young age, and then you got married and you had a daughter. And, uh, and then there was, some, there was some fidelity issues there in trust, and then you were in several other relationships that kind of resulted in the same. And in uh, the last one was when you were actually, and I don't know if, was this the last one? When you were getting onto the sh- when you're on the show, you had a roommate that um, was in the military, and something about uh, an altercation or an argument or a disagreement you guys had resulted in um, in this man that was in your life committing suicide in your house, um, and you carried on like you you had you had to, you pushed through regardless of what was going on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What was going through your mind when all of that was happening? Well, you know, this took place just weeks before before I filmed Naked and Afraid. Um, so I really had no other choice but to push it to the side because I knew I was about to face one of the most difficult challenges physically of my life. And, and so in doing that, um, you know, I, I just kind of buried everything, which was the worst thing I could have done. But, I I mean, I was weeks away from doing this, and I couldn't have anything hindering me. Mm. And so once I was out in that environment, you know, and then Julio leaves, I'm alone with my thoughts. Yeah. And and that's when everything really hit me, what had happened. So do you think that there was a time when when Julio was there, and this was kind of like brewing in the back of your mind? Absolutely. Julio and I talked about it. Mm. So you were processing it there with somebody. I was. With Julio. I was, and one of my medics um, actually wore Greg's dog tags um, during the whole show. That way, um, I had a piece of him out there with me, you know, to kind of mm-hmm. motivate me and drive me. So mm-hmm. that was pretty special. Um, when we were filming, they they centered the episode. That's that. By the way, is what you him. that by the way is what you call a bridge and an anchor, and I'll get into that in a fourth segment. Uh, the the dog tags and a piece of something that brought you to a different moment. Okay, so I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... That's okay. Interesting how people figure this stuff out. It really is. Yeah, yeah. So you were saying this is... Uh, that brought... That made more the, the show more about him. Yeah, they really centered it around Greg and, and my recovery process. Um, and it was it was beautiful. Um, you know, the, the final cut of filming was them handing his dog tags back to me wow. when I completed the challenge. And... You want to talk about emotional? Oh my gosh, I'm tearing up right now. It was um, it was amazing. You know, to be able to honor him with that. So you dedicated your your survival and like your push through to a person who lost their life in your home that you haven't even had time to grieve about. 
Right. Yeah. And it was, it was moving, you know, that's some raw human emotion. And it was really frustrating because the whole thing was completely edited out. I mean, not a word of it was spoken. So that was, um, that was heartbreaking, you Mm. know, during the premiere of the show, um, I was very emotional and I was prepared to be emotional in seeing the recovery process of dealing with Greg's death and, and then none of it was shown. So it was, it was a pretty big slap in the face and a slap in the face to the veteran community because that could have really spoken to a lot of veterans that struggle with PTSD, you know, and, and the effect that it has on their loved ones, you know, because you really got to watch me struggle through it, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and speak out. Yeah. And and, And, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, what's going through your mind? Are you saying something to the effect of, you know, what would Greg want me to do? Greg, you know, pushing, I need to push through for Greg. And is that what's kind of, generating momentum in you um like did that did that happen it happened every single day Mm. you know i mean i knew that he was with me and i knew that you know he would be there telling me you know suck it up um you know keep going we've trained for this i mean he was a big part of my training and i didn't want to let him down so he was a big um motivation and and force um in my drive to move on Wow. Wow. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's some experience. I, I can't even put my hands around something like that. Um, yeah. It just kind of speaks volumes to, to the kind of person that you are. You know, I mean, here you are eating little fish and you're drinking from a dirty pail and like eating snakes <laughs> and, <laughs> and like your bath hole had an alligator in it. And, oh, uh, my and then your partner left you and, uh, and so then you're here by yourself, and, as, and it, they, they showed some bear move, running around the area or something like that. And yeah. I mean, you're just being bombarded with stuff. So what did you do? Like, you know, that, that sounds a lot like life can get really overwhelming. Here's bills. Here's peer pressure. Here's social media. Here's the mistake I made. Here's the picture floating around. You're being bomb- Here's the pressure from mom and dad. And, and just bombarded by pressure everywhere. Like, how did you... How did you synthesize out of that? You just had to take it one day at a time. You know, if you look too far in the future of, Mm -hmm. I have 15 days left, that will overwhelm you to the point that your mind will take over and and will tell you that you physically can't go on. Okay, So I really tried to avoid that. It's not in the future. Okay, what else? Um, Just having a concrete plan, you know? Okay, Mm -hmm. so I need to have my firewood supply, you know, have my fire going. Mm -hmm. I need to search for food i mean i'm pretty limited on my options right but just just having a plan and a routine that way i kind of knew what to expect next and you know in my day-to-day yeah so that's present that's something that you can non like in the here and now right 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 What, what about past did any of that affect you did you did you go there as far as did i mean were you thinking about your past i mean when, when you were let's say that you're laying down in, in your hut or next to that fire like what are you thinking about are you thinking about things you, you replaying things in your mind like is greg on your mind you th- replaying things in your childhood is all that kind of floating around i'm replaying everything rusty mm-hmm. i'm replaying all the trauma i'm replaying um the stuff with greg and the the battered relationships that I, that I had currently that, that I just, I made a choice when I was out there. I want to repair those, you know, being out there made you realize the, the value of relationships and the value of, of these non-materialistic things that matter so much more, you know, these silly fights that you have with people that, that destroy these relationships. I made a choice that I'm going to go home and I'm going to fix that. You know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to drive straight to California and I'm going to go see my dad and I'm going to make it right with him. You know, it just really made me take a second look at my life and what I wanted to do to better it and, um, you know, repair these these obstacles in my life um, that I didn't want to go another day without, you know, without it being repaired. I don't know. It was just something about being out there and being alone that made you realize the value of of people and friends and family you know it kind of reminds me of um and and nothing to the degree that you've went through but they have these wilderness programs for for teenagers and uh and just disturbed teens and what they do is they 
you know, they go into this program, they have counseling, they have family counseling. But then the, the, big, the biggest part of that program is that they'll take them out. And these programs are usually like in Colorado, Utah, somewhere remote, mountainous. And they take them out to a remote area of the country and then they leave them there to survive. Now, of course, the guy, the counselor is close by, but he's hidden. And, you know, he's, he's at a distance where he can watch and see what's going on. But he'll, he'll put, you know, the, the, the whole, the, the theory behind it is that you put an individual in a distressing situation where they have to kind of survive. It's like a little mini, teeny, little, little microcosm survival or naked and afraid, not really naked and afraid, but... <laughs> But a survival right, situation, right. Same idea. you know, <laughs> same idea where they have to gather food, they have to, you know, build a fire, they have to build shelter, and and the, it's designed to kind of have them have that moment and process. So maybe what it sounds like is that that's something that is an essential, is that needing to have time to really process this information and really have oh, time absolutely. to kind of, you know, uh, like replay. And before you say anything, we're running up on 30 seconds, so hold your answer until we come back. But it's really having time to process those things as as you're alone and, and you know, nobody's around. We'll be right back. We're going to take a quick message. Quick break. <laughs> The Russ Martin Show. What are the little fish that, that <laughs> hang under sharks? The ones you always see like in shark. I know, but what are they called? Uh, pilot fish. Pilot fish, yes. Why are they called pilot fish? Uh, it's not like they're driving the shark. <laughs> no. <they're... laughs> what are you doing? I'm driving this shark. <laughs> the Russ Martin Show. Not to be left out, there's Leprechaun in the Hood, which came out in 2000, which was... Oh, man. That, he had to have a field day stealing gold teeth. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, 7 to 11. Talk Radio, 1190. Why have over 3 million guys switched to Harry's razors? Because we make just one perfect razor with five precision blades. We own the factory, cut out the middleman, and sell our blades for half of other overpriced five-blade alternatives. Now we're dropping the half-price sound effects guy. Wait, why? Harry's. One perfect razor. None of the extra noise. Visit harrys.com today and use code 1717 to get a special trial offer. That's harrys.com, code 1717. If you've fallen behind on your taxes, you know that the IRS is already coming for their money. And they'll get it, too, by garnishing your wages or maybe even taking your home or business. They call it enforced compliance. And you'd better watch out because the penalties and interest compound daily, making it seem impossible to ever get out of debt. You need to call the experts at Optima Tax Relief. Solving tax issues is all they do. One call to Optima starts the process to stop the demand letters and stop aggressive collection actions. They get to work immediately, fighting to protect your assets and helping you put your tax problems behind you. The IRS writes off millions every year and Optima knows all the ins and outs of the IRS's tax assistance programs that could save you thousands. So what are you waiting for? Call Optima now for a free consultation. Call 800-798-2477. That's 800-798-2477. 800- 798-2477. Optima Tax Relief. Some restrictions apply. For complete details, please visit OptimaTaxRelief.com. I'm Tony Goldwyn. 20 years ago, when my mom had lung cancer, she didn't have many choices. But today, you do. If you've been diagnosed with lung cancer, please visit StandUpToCancer.org slash lung cancer to learn more. You're listening to the Therapy Hour with Rusty Lozano. Brought to you by the Center for Biofeedback and Behavior Therapy in Addison, Texas. Hello and welcome back to the show. This is our last segment and if you're just joining us, we've been visiting with Tani Lynn. She is a, uh, she was a contestant on Naked and Afraid two times and, uh, and I, dude, I love this show. I love meeting with these with these individuals and they're so interesting. They're such good people and they have some really amazing stories that kind of what gives you the backdrop of like why they, they seek out things like this. You know, it's, it's like a, a therapeutic quest and, um, and, and, you know, and, and her story really seems to kind of fit the mold. Uh, so Tony, um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you had mentioned something to the effect of, um, you had some, like you had lost a friend, you committed suicide when you were actually, you starting to film 
and uh, you didn't pull away from the show. You actually surged through and like you did the show. And uh, and and so one of the things that was really important to you and and meaningful was that the medic, because because uh, your friend Greg was a medic, but the medic had worn his dog tags, and uh, and that was a really meaningful a meaningful gesture. Um, why is that? Just being able to have a piece of him that seemed physical, you know, that had him be like a part of the challenge and a part of the journey to know that one of the most important pieces of his military career, you know, um, I guess like a souvenir, so to speak, mm-hmm. was was physically there with me. So it was so, almost like he never really left and, and it was symbolic that uh, exactly you saw the dog tags and you associated it with your with your friend. Right, and being able to have that visual piece, um, it was almost like a pick-me-up, you know, Mm -hmm. an encouragement. So, do you mind talking about Greg a little bit? Do you want to do that? Yeah, we can. Um, So, if you're comfortable, but was he, so he was uh, active, he was active military, was he experiencing PTSD? Absolutely, and you know, I didn't, I didn't know the signs until after he passed, Mm -hmm. They were right there in front of me. You know, the things that he would do and say, um, they struck me a little bit odd, but I didn't know until after the fact that they were very clear signs of PTSD. What sort of things was he doing? What stood out? Well, for one thing, he always had to have um, earbuds in. You know, he'd be walking around the house and go to sleep with earbuds in, and he had, you know music obviously blaring and it was never turned off and Mm. i didn't know until after he died that he was actually drowning voices out you know with that music you know that was his way of 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 kind of drowning that out so was he was he describing well well, i guess he never talked to you about it was it like uh, like, hallucinations be like good lord why why don't you ever turn that crap off? You know, like mm-hmm. God, it's always on. And I feel so bad for giving him such a hard time about it. But, um, you know, being a medic, you see the worst of the worst, you mm-hmm. know, and there's people you can't save and you can't, you can't drown out those voices. You know, you, you carry that with you for the rest of your life. And he was very clearly trying in his best way to drown that out. You know, um, no one will ever know unless you've been in his shoes what he encountered and, and the, um, you know, how, so how they take trauma. it so personal when, when they can't save someone. You know, they carry that. They take responsibility for that. So he was probably around uh, these soldiers and with their last breath and their, their last words. Right. Right. And and he since he being the last one, probably a lot of them had uh had said their last messages, tell my mom or tell my family. And so uh you know, somebody having the the well, I don't want to say the burden, but the responsibility of you know, having to carry that and then you know, wow. I can only imagine how that would actually play with your mind. Right. I I have no concept of what what was going on in his head. So you saw the earbuds. He's, he, he was drowning out sounds and, and, you know, images and probably, you know, things that, that he'd encountered. What else did you see with him that, that kind of let you know that there was there were issues? Well, another thing that he would do, um, he would always go to sleep with, with his Glock on his chest. You know, like he was always always ready, you know, for something to happen. And I don't, I don't know what exactly triggered that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, past experiences, but it, it did strike me as a little bit odd. You know, I'm all about having a weapon on my nightstand. Um, you know, I fully support that. But just the way that he did it, it just, you know, there was something very disturbing about it. Mm-hmm. Um, like he was and, always on the ready, and uh, right, this was right. a loaded and, pistol. Yes. Right, and he would sit there on the couch, and he would he would rack the slide, you know, and dry fire just constantly, you know, all day long, and it would drive me nuts. I'm just like, okay, you know, like chill out. So he's but, probably, um, I mean, he's probably replaying images or or scenarios in his mind, 
and and going through the motions on a small right, level, right. kind of like you know that unfinished business, that playing things out. Yeah, hmm. and he was going through so much at the time. You know, his wife had just left him and took his kids, and he hadn't seen his kids in probably six months. Um, he had nowhere to go, and you know, I've been in his shoes where I've had nowhere to go, and I didn't want him to to experience that. You know, my heart went out to him. I didn't want him to feel like he didn't have a place to call home. And so I opened up my doors to him and let him know, this is your home. You have a place to go, you know. And so he, he was sleeping on the couch. Um, my brother and I um, were roommates also. And my brother was actually sitting next to him when, when he killed himself. And um, so... But anyways, you know, I just I just wanted him to have that comfort. You know, when we had so many plans, we were planning on getting a bigger place and um, he was going to have his own bedroom. And, you know, I just tried to, to give him hope and to give him something to look forward to and just encourage him. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I guess the argument that we had the day that he did take his life was just, I mean, I try not to blame myself, but... Um, it's hard not to knowing that that was our last encounter, you know, was, was this negativity. And so you can't help but wonder, you know, what if, and, and, you know, what if I had just replied to his text message and, you know, told him I accept his apology, you know, or, or something. I mean, it just it says so much about how you need to not let the little things get in the way of, of communicating and telling that person, I love you. And, you know, um, it's just been a real, real life lesson for me. You know, um, those that what you just explained is uh, is very. It's a heavy toll for you to carry around and and to think about, and uh, and yes, and and the realization that there are small things and and be grateful for what you have, and then but really what what um what intrigues me the most about this is like the, the what ifs, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a little story about, um, about the kind of car that I drive. I, in my experience, I've only had one, one client actually, uh, commit suicide. And, um, and he was a young man and I won't say too much about anything, but, um, but it, it affected me so badly because, uh, because of the way that I found out about it. And, and I went through the same thing. I went through the same, you know, what could I have done differently? The what is, because I'd been in touch with him a few weeks before. And, you know, when I was alerted that he needed help and, uh, and I was reaching out to him and I kept reaching out to him. And then the last thing he said, and it was probably about a week before it all happened. Um, he says, I'll get in touch with you. I'll get in touch with you next week. You know, everything's okay. I'll get in touch with you next week. Well, that was, you know, my call to, to let me know that, okay, well, Things are great. Well, he never got in touch with me and like the what ifs of like, well, how come I didn't reach out to him? So you're going to have those, Tawny. I mean, I think that uh, in a situation like this, uh, this individual in your life and, and even in my case, um, they were playing things out. You know, there, there, was, there were things that they were contemplating. And, and in situations where it's so distressful, it's, you can't blame yourself because it's what you want to do. Um, but you had to think to yourself that maybe uh, the scenarios and the circumstances they were dealing with was just just a little bit above like what you could have helped them with. Right. And I really had to, you know, educate myself and reach out to other veterans with that experience um, to, to realize that once someone makes up their mind, you know, to, to take that action – there's really nothing anyone can say or do to deter them. You know, um, it's a choice. And when someone is that far gone and, you know, the, the demons have, have taken over, it's kind of, you know, a no turning back sort of thing. And I don't know that, that I could have done anything, you know, and, um, even if, the day had gone on and, and we did talk and everything was fine. It could have happened a week later, you know? Yeah. Um, it's hard to really know where someone's at if they don't talk about it and they don't, um, 
take advantage of their resources and get the help that they need or just speak up and say, I'm not okay. And that's the thing I think that it's important to kind of think to get the help. And, and, you know, the suicide crisis hotline um, is, is always something that you want, you know, any individual can, can look up um, and, and get help because you, there are two types of reasoning. There's emotional reasoning, which is going to uh, lead to, substantial emotional effect and uh and then there's intellectual reasoning um and those that type of reasoning is something that is you can think a little bit more rationally but it's hard to do you know in the moment i'm going to give that national suicide prevention hotline number out it's 1-800-273-8255 and uh, as we end the show i want to uh just extend a, a big thank you for sharing your story with us. I mean, I, you know, I think it's really helped a lot of people. And uh, and to, to also just congratulate you on your quest and, like, your journey to move ahead beyond these circumstances. And um, and it sounds like you've really done quite well for yourself, Donnie. I'm really proud of you. You have a big fan over here. So, uh, <laughs> well, thank you so yeah, much. Thank for, you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for being on the show. And thank you for listening. Um, again, that phone number, Suicide National Crisis Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. Have a great afternoon.